Peer Bucks, The Terror of Hunsur by A. Mervyn Smith Peer Bucks was the largest elephant in the Madras Government Commissariat Department. He stood 9 feet 6 inches at the shoulder and more than 10 feet at the highest point of the convexity of the backbone. His tusks protruded 3.5 feet and were massive and solid with a slight curve upwards and outwards. His trunk was large and massive, while the skin was soft as velvet and mottled red and white as high-class elephants should be. His pillar-like forelegs were as straight as a beeline from shoulder to foot and showed muscle enough for half a dozen elephants. Physically, Pier Bucks was the beau ideal of elephantine beauty, a brute that should have fetched 15,000 rupees in the market and still be cheap at that price, for was he not a grander elephant to look at than many a beast that had cost its princely honour double that sum? He was quiet, too, and docile, and could generally be driven by a child. Yet, with all his good qualities, with all his majestic proportions, Peer Bucks was tabooed by the natives. No local would have him as a gift. He was a marked beast. His tail was bifurcated at the extremity. This signified to those locals, learnt in elephant lore, that he would one day take human life. When captured in the Kedas in Michael's Valley, Coimbatore district, the European official in charge of the Keda operations imagined the animal would bring a fancy price. But at the public sale of the captured herd, no one would give a bid for him although his tusks alone would have fetched over a thousand rupees for their ivory. The fatal blemish, the divided tail, was soon known to intending purchasers, and there being no bidders, he had to be retained for government use. The commissariat department was justly proud of Pier Bucks. He had done good service for six years. When the heavy guns stuck in the mud, when the artillery was on its way to Bellari, Peer Bucks was sent to assist, and with a push of his massive head he would lift the great cannon, however deep its wheels might be embedded in the unctuous black cotton soil. When heavy stones were required at Markara, Peer Bucks would mount the steep cart road and think nothing of a ton and a half load on his back. The forest department too found him invaluable in drawing heavy logs from the heart of the reserves. His register of conduct was blameless, and beyond occasional fits of temper during the must season once a year, he was one of the most even-tempered as well as one of the most useful beasts in the transport establishment. The commissariat sergeant at Hunsur, who had known Pier Bucks for two years, would smile when allusion was made to his bifurcated tail and the native superstition regarding that malformation. Look up his register, he would say. No man killing there. Why, I would rather trust Peer Bucks than any other elephant, male or female, in the lines. He wouldn't even kill a fly. But a little while, and quite another story had to be told of Peer Bucks. This pattern animal had gone must. Fazul, his usual mahout, or keeper, was not there to manage him. He had gone with Sanderson to Assam and the new keeper had struck Peer Bucks when he showed temper, and had been torn limb from limb by the irritated brute. Peer Bucks had broken his chains, had stampeded the Amrut Mahal cattle at Hunsur, had broken into the government harness and boot factory and done incredible damage. He had gone off on the rampage on the Manantari road. He had overturned coffee carts and scattered their contents on the road had killed several cart men, had looted several villages and torn down the huts. In fact, a homicidal mania seemed to have come over him, as he would steal into the Sorkham millet fields and pull down the machans, or bamboo platforms, on which the cultivator sat watching his corn by night, and tear the poor wretch to pieces or trample him out of all shape and it was even said that in his blind rage he would eat portions of his human victims. I should mention here that natives firmly believe that 
elephants will occasionally take to man-eating. It is a common practice when a tiger is killed for the mahouts to dip balls of jaggery or coarse sugar in the tiger's blood and feed it to the elephants that took part in the drive with this mess. They say that the taste of the tiger's blood gives the elephant courage to face these fierce brutes. The taste for blood thus acquired sticks to the elephant, and when he goes mad or must and takes to killing human beings, some of their blood gets into his mouth and reminds him of the sugar and blood given to him at the tiger hunts, and he occasionally indulges in a mouthful of raw human flesh. So, was Pierre Buck's must, or was he really mad? The Mahouts at Hunsur, who knew him well, said he was only must. Europeans frequently speak of must elephants as mad elephants, as though the two terms were synonymous. Must, I may state, is a periodical functional derangement common to all bull elephants, and corresponds to the rutting season with deer and other animals. It generally occurs in the male once a year, usually in March or April, and lasts about two or three months. During this period, a dark-colored mucus discharge oozes from the temples. If this discharge is carefully washed off twice a day, and the elephant is given a certain amount of opium with his food, and made to stand up to his middle in water for an hour every day, beyond a little uneasiness and irritability in temper, no evil consequences ensue. But should these precautions be neglected, the animal becomes savage and even furious for a time, so that it is never safe to approach him during these periods. When an elephant shows signs of must, the dark discharge at the temples is an infallible sign he should always be securely hobbled and chained. A must elephant, even when he breaks loose and does a lot of damage, can, if recaptured, be broken to discipline and will become as docile as ever after the must period is past. On the other hand, a mad elephant is a wholly different animal. These broods should be destroyed at once, as they never recovered their senses, the derangement in their case being cerebral and permanent, and not merely functional. This madness is frequently due to sunstroke, as elephants are by nature fitted to live under the deep shade of primeval forests. In the wild state they feed only at night, when they come out into the open. They retire at dawn into the depths of the forests, so that they are never fully exposed to the full heat of the noonday sun. Pier Bucks, being the property of the Madras government, permission was asked to destroy him, as he had done much damage to life and property in that portion of the Mysore territory lying between Hunsur and the frontier of Kuorg and North Wainad. The commissariat department, however, regarded him as too valuable an animal to be shot, and advised that some attempt should be made to recapture him with the aid of tame elephants. Several trained elephants were sent up from Coimbatore, some more were obtained from the Mysore state, and several hunts were organized, but all attempts at his recapture entirely failed. The great length of his forelegs gave Pierbox an enormous stretch, so that he could easily outpace the fleetest shikar elephants, and when he showed fight, none of the tuskers, not even the famous Jung Bahadur, the fighting elephant of the Maharaja of Mysore could withstand his charge. Meanwhile, so great was the terror he inspired that nearly all traffic was stopped between Hunsur and Koorg and Mysore and Manantadi. He had been at large now for nearly two months, and in that time was known to have killed fourteen persons, wrecked two villages, and done an incredible amount of damage to traffic and crops. In an evil moment for himself, he took it into his head to stampede the collector's camp on the Wainad frontier. The collector was away at Manantadi, but his tents and belongings were destroyed, and one camp follower killed. Permission was now obtained to destroy him by any means possible, and a government reward was offered to anyone who would kill the brute. Several parties went out from Bangalore in the hope of bagging him, but never got sight of him. He was here today, 
and twenty miles off next day. He was never known to attack Europeans. He would lie in wait in some unfrequented part of the road and allow any suspicious-looking object to pass. But when he saw a line of native carts or a small company of native travelers, he would rush out with a scream and a trumpet and overturn carts and kick them to pieces and woe betide the unfortunate human being that fell into his clutches. He would smash them to a pulp beneath his huge feet, or tear them into pieces from limb to limb. Much of the above information regarding Pier Bucks was gleaned at the dark bungalow, or traveller's rest house, at Hunsur, where a party of four, including myself, were staying while engaged in a shooting trip along that belt of forest which forms the boundary between Mysore and the British territory to the southwest. Our shoot thus far had been very unsuccessful. Beyond a few spotted deer and some game birds, we had bagged nothing. The government notification of a reward for the destruction of the rogue elephant stared us in the face at every turn we took in the long, cool veranda of the bungalow. We had not come out prepared for elephant shooting, yet there was a sufficiency of heavy metal in our armory we thought to try conclusions with even so formidable an antagonist as Pier Bucks, should we meet him there. Disgust at the want of success hitherto of our Shikar expedition, and the tantalizing effects of the government notice showing that there was game very much in evidence if we cared to go after it, soon determined our movements. The native Shikaris were summoned and after much consultation we shifted camp to Karkan Koti, a smaller village in the state forest of that name and on the high road to Manan Todi. The traveller's bungalow there, a second-class one, was deserted by its usual native attendants, as the rogue elephant had paid two visits to that place and had pulled down a portion of the out-offices in his attempts to get at the servants. In the village we found only a family of Karumbas, left in charge by the Patel, or village magistrate, when the inhabitants deserted it. These people, we found, had erected for themselves a machan, or platform on the trees, to which they retired at night to be out of the reach of the elephant, should he come that way. From them we learned that the rogue had not been seen for a week, but that it was about his time to come that way, as he had a practice of making a complete circuit of the country lying between the frontier and the Manantari, Mysore, and Hunsur Merkara roads. This was good news, so we set to work at once, getting ammunition ready for this, the largest of all game. Nothing less than eight drams of powder and a hardened solid ball would content most of us. Keith, a poor fellow, had been reading up smooth boar, or some other authority on Indian game, and pinned his faith to a twelve-bore duck gun. For, he argued, at twenty paces, and that was the maximum distance from which to shoot an elephant, the smooth boar will shoot as straight as the rifle and hit quite as hard. Our horses and pack bullocks were picketed within one of the out offices, and all the native servants took shelter inside the other. Great fires were kindled before the out offices as a precautionary measure, not that we expected the elephant that night. We were in bed early, as we meant to be up at daybreak and have a good hunt all round, under the guidance of the Karumbas, who promised to take us to the rogue's favourite haunts when in that neighbourhood. The dark bungalow had but two rooms. That in which Otis and myself slept had a window overlooking the out offices. In the adjacent room slept Philip and Keith. Towards the small hours of the morning, I was awakened by a loud discharge of firearms from Philip's room, followed by the unmistakable fierce trumpeting of an enraged elephant. There is no mistaking that sound when once heard. Catching up our rifles, we rushed into the next room and found Philip, gun in hand, peering out through the broken window frame, and Keith trying to strike a light. When Philip had recovered sufficiently from his excitement, he explained that he had been awakened by something trying to encircle his feet through the thick folds of the rug he had wrapped around them. 
On looking up, he thought he could make out the trunk of an elephant thrust through the opening where a pane of glass had been broken in the window. His loaded gun was in the corner by his side, and aiming at what he thought would be the direction of the head, he fired both barrels at once. With a loud scream, the elephant withdrew its trunk, smashing the whole window at the same time. He had reloaded and was looking out for the elephant in case it should return to the attack, but could see nothing as it was too dark. Phillips was a narrow escape, for had the elephant succeeded in getting his trunk round one of his legs, nothing could have saved him. With one jerk, he would have been pulled through the window and quickly done to death beneath the huge feet of the brute. The thick folds of the blanket alone saved him and even that would have been pulled aside in a little time if he had not awakened and had the presence of mind to fire at the beast. No amount of shouting would bring any of the servants from their retreat in the out-office, although we could distinctly hear them talking to each other in low tones, and it was scarcely fair of us to ask them to come out with the probability of an infuriated rogue elephant being about. However, we soon remembered this fact, and helping ourselves to whiskey pegs, as the excitement had made us thirsty, we determined to sit out the darkness as nothing could be done until morning. At the first break of day, we sallied out to learn the effects of Philip's shots. We could distinctly trace the huge impressions of the elephant's feet to the forest skirting the bungalow, but could find no trace of blood. The Karumba trackers were soon on the spot, and on matters being explained to them, they said the elephant must be badly wounded in the face, otherwise he would have renewed the attack. The shots being fired at such close quarters must have scorched the opening of the wound and prevented the immediate flow of blood. They added that if wounded, the elephant would not go far, but would make for the nearest water in search of mud with which to plaster the wound as mud was a sovereign remedy for all elephant wounds, and all elephants used it. The brute would then lie up in some dense thicket for a day or two, as any exertion would tend to reopen the wound. The Karumbas appeared to be so thoroughly acquainted with the habits of these beasts that we readily placed ourselves under their guidance, and swallowing a hasty breakfast, we set off on the trail, taking with us one shikari to interpret and a gun-bearer named Suleiman to carry a tiffin basket. The tracks ran parallel with the road for about a mile, and then crossed it and made south in the direction of the Kabini River, a tributary of the Kaveri River. Distinct traces of blood could now be seen, and presently we came to a spot covered with blood where the elephant had evidently stood for some time. The country became more and more difficult as we approached the river. Dense clumps of bamboo and weight of bit thorns, with here and there a large teak tree, made it difficult to see more than a few yards ahead. The Karumba guides said that we must now advance more cautiously, as the river was within half a mile, and that we might come on the rogue at any moment. Up to this moment, I don't know if any of us appreciated the full extent of the danger we were running. Following up a wounded must elephant on foot, in dense cover, such as we were in, meant that if we did not drop the brute with the first shot, one or more of us would in all likelihood pay for our temerity with our lives. We had been on the tramp two hours, and we were all of us more or less excited, so taking a sip of cold tea to steady our nerves, we settled on a plan of operations. Philip and I, having the heaviest guns, were to lead the Karumba trackers being a pace or two in advance of us. Otis and Keith were to follow about five paces behind, and the Shikari and Suleiman were to bring up the rear at an interval of ten paces. If we came on the elephant, the advance party was to fire first, and then move aside. If the brute survived our fire, the second battery would surely account for it. It never entered our minds, that anything living could withstand a discharge at close quarters of eight such barrels as we carried. Having settled matters to our satisfaction, 
Off we set on the trail, moving now very cautiously, the guides enjoining the strictest silence. Every bush was carefully examined, every thicket scanned before an advance was made. Frequent stops were made, and the drops of blood carefully examined to see if they were clotted or not, as by this the Karumbas could tell how far off the wounded brute was. The excitement was intense. The rustle of a falling leaf would set our hearts pit a pat. The nervous strain was too great, and I began to feel quite sick. The trail now entered a cart track through a forest so that we could see twenty paces or so ahead. Now we were approaching the river, for we could hear the murmuring of the water some two or three hundred yards ahead of us. The bamboo clumps grew thicker on either side. The leading karumba was just indicating that the trail led off to the right, when a terrific trumpet directly behind us made us start round, and a ghastly sight met our view. The elephant had evidently scented us long before we appeared in view, and had left the cart track, and making a slight detour to the right, had gone back a little way and concealed itself behind some bamboo clumps near the track. It had quietly allowed us to pass, and then, uttering a shrill scream, charged on the rear. Seizing Suleiman in its trunk, it had lifted him aloft prior to dashing him to the ground when we turned. Keith was standing in the path, about ten paces from the elephant, with his gun leveled at the brute. Fire, Keith, fire! We shouted, but it was too late. Down came the trunk, and the body of poor Suleiman, hurled with terrific force, was dashed on the ground with a sickening thud which told us he was beyond help. As the trunk was coming down, Keith fired. In a moment, the enraged brute was on him. We heard a second shot, and then saw poor Keith and his gun flying through the air with a kick from the elephant's forefoot. There was no time to aim. Indeed, there was nothing to aim at, as all we could see was a great black object coming down on us with incredible speed. Four shots in rapid succession, and the brute swerved to the left and went off screaming and crashing through the bamboos in its wild flight. Rapidly reloading, we waited to see if the rogue would come back, but we heard the crashing of the underwood further off and knew it had gone for good. We had now time to look round. The body of Keith we found at the top of a bamboo clump a good many yards away. We thought he was dead, as he did not reply to our calls, but on cutting down the bamboos and removing the body, we found he had only swooned. A glass of whiskey soon brought him round, but he was unable to move, as his spine was injured and several ribs were broken. Rigging a hammock, we had him carried into Manin Toddy, where he was on the doctor's hands for months before he was able to move, and finally he had to go back to England, and, I believe, never thoroughly recovered his health. Suleiman's corpse had to be taken into Antarasante, and after an inquest by the native magistrate, it was made over to the poor fellow's co-religionists for burial. The subsequent history of Pierre Bucks, how he killed two English officers, and afterwards met his own fate, I must reserve for another chapter. Part 2 our tragic adventure with Pierre Bucks, the rogue elephant, related in the last chapter, was soon noised abroad, and served only to attract a greater number of British sportsmen bent on trying conclusions with the terror of Hunsur, as this notorious brute came to be called by the inhabitants of the adjacent districts. A month had elapsed since our ill-fated expedition, and nothing had been heard of the rogue although its known haunts had been scoured by some of the most noted shikaris of South India. We began to think that the wounds it had received in its encounter with us had proved fatal, and even contemplated claiming its tusks should its carcass be found and presenting them to Keith as a memento of his terrible experience with the monster. But it was a case of counting your chickens— for evidence was soon forthcoming that its tusks were not to be had for the asking. The beast had evidently been lying low while its wounds healed, 
and had retreated for this purpose into some of the most dense fastnesses of the Begur jungles. Among others who arrived on the scene at this time to do battle with the terror were two young officers from Kananor, one a subaltern in a native regiment, and the other a naval officer on a visit to that station. They had both come with letters of introduction to Colonel Martin, in charge of the Amrut Mahal at Hunsur, and that Colonel Martin had done all in his power to dissuade the youngsters from going after the rogue, as he saw plainly that they were green at Shikar and did not fully comprehend the risks they would be running, nor had they experience enough to enable them to provide against possible contingencies. Finding, however, that dissuasion only strengthened their determination to brave all danger, he thought he would do the next best thing by giving them the best mount possible for such a task. Among the recent arrivals at the commissariat lines was Dodd Kampa, the Great Red One, a famous tusker sent down all the way from Sikandarabad to do battle with Pier Bucks. Dodd Kampa was known to be staunch, as he had been frequently used for tiger shooting in the notorious Nirmul jungles and had unflinchingly stood the charge of a wounded tiger. His mahout, or caretaker, declared that the terror of Hunsur would run at the mere sight of Dodd Kempa, for had not his reputation gone forth throughout the length and breadth of India, even among the elephant folk. Dodd Kempa was not as tall as Spear Bucks, but was more sturdily built, with short, massive tusks. He was mottled all over his body with red spots, hence his name Kampa, or Red. He was a veritable bulldog among elephants, and was by no means a handsome brute, but he had repeatedly done good service in bringing to order recalcitrant pachyderms, and for this reason had been singled out to try conclusions with the rogue of Hunsur. With such a mount, Colonel Martin thought the young fellows would be safe should they meet the terror, so seeing them safely mounted on the pad, he bid them not to fail to call on Dick Durbin, the forest officer on the Kuorg frontier, who would put them up to the best means of finding the game they were after. They had been gone about four days, when one morning the commissariat sergeant turned up at Colonel Martin's bungalow, and with a salute informed him that Dodd Kampa was in the lines, and that his mahout was drunk and incapable, and that he could get no information from him. The elephant and mahout had turned up some time during the night, the pad had been left behind, and the man could give no information about the two sahibs who had gone out with him. Fearing the worst, the colonel sent for the mahout, but before the order could be carried out, a crowd of mahouts and other natives were seen approaching, shouting, Pagali Hogea, Pagali Hogea, or He has gone mad, he has gone mad. And yes, sure enough, there was Dodd Kampa's Mahout, inanely grinning and shaking his hands. Now and again he would stop and look behind, and a look of terror would come into his eyes. He would crouch down and put his hands to his ears as if to shut out some dreadful sound. He would remain like this for a minute or two, glance furtively around, and then, as if reassured, would get up and smile and shake his hands. It was plainly not liquor that made him behave in this manner. The poor fellow had actually become an imbecile through fear. It was hopeless attempting to get any information from such an object, so handing him over to the care of the medical officer, a search party mounted on elephants was at once organized and sent off in the direction of Fraser Pit, twenty-four miles distant, where Dick Durbin's camp was. When they got about halfway, they were met by a native forest ranger, who asked them to stop and come back with him to a country cart that followed, in which were the dead bodies of the two unfortunate officers of whom they were in search. On coming up with the cart, and examining its contents, a most gruesome sight met their eyes. There, rolled up in a native kumbli or blanket, was an indistinguishable mass of human flesh, mud, and clothing. Crushed out of all shape, the bodies were inextricably mixed together, 
puddled into one mass by the great feet of the must elephant. None dared touch the shapeless heap where not but the boot-covered feet were distinguishable to show that two human beings lay there. A deep gloom fell on all, natives and Europeans alike. None dared speak above a whisper, and in silence the search party turned back, taking with them what was once two gallant young officers, but now an object that made anyone shudder to look at. The forest ranger's story was soon told. He had been an eyewitness of the tragic occurrence, and here's the story in his own words. The officers arrived two days ago at Periyar Patna, a large village, halfway to Fraser Pet, and while camped there, a native brought in information of a bullock having been killed at his village some four miles off. The sahibs, determined to sit up in a machan over the kill and do for the tiger when he returned to his meal. They left their camp followers and baggage at Periyar Patna, and accompanied only by himself, the ranger, and the native who brought the information, they rode out on Dodd Kampa, took their places on the machan, and sent the mahout back with the elephant with orders for him to come back at dawn next day to take them back to camp. The tiger did not turn up that night, and the whole party were on their way back to Periya Patna in the early dawn, when suddenly Dodd Kampa stopped, and striking the ground with the end of his trunk, made that peculiar drumming noise which is the usual signal of alarm with these animals when they scent a tiger or other danger. It was still early morning, so that they could barely see any object in the shadow of the forest trees. The elephant now began to back, curl away his trunk, and sway his head from side to side. The mahout said he was about to charge, and that there must be another elephant in the path. We could barely keep our seats on the pad, so violent was the motion caused by the elephant backing and swaying from side to side. The officers had to hold on tight by the ropes so that they could not use their guns when there in the distance. Only fifty yards off, we saw an enormous elephant coming towards us. There was no doubt that it was the rogue from its great size. It had not seen us yet, as elephants see very badly, but Dodd Kampa had scented him out as the wind was in our favor. The sahibs urged the mahout to keep his elephants quiet so that they might use their guns, but it was no use, for although he cruelly beat the beast about the head with his iron goad, yet it continued to back and sway. The rogue had now got within thirty yards when it perceived us and stopped. It backed a few paces, and with ears thrown forward, uttered trumpet after trumpet, and then came full charge down on us. No sooner did Dodd Kampa hear the trumpeting than he turned round and bolted off into the forest, crashing through the brushwood and under the branches of the large trees, the must elephant in hot pursuit. Suddenly, an overhanging branch caught in the side of the pad ripped it clean off the elephant's back and threw the two officers on the ground. I managed to seize the branch and clambered up out of harm's way. When I recovered a little from my fright, I saw the rogue elephant crushing something up under its four feet. Now and again it would stoop and drive its tusks into the mass and begin stamping on it again. This it did for about a quarter of an hour. It then went off in the direction that Dodd Kampa had taken. I saw nothing of Dodd Kampa after the pad fell off. I waited for two hours, and seeing the mad elephant did not come back, I got down and ran to Periya Patna and told the sahib's servants, and we went back with a lot of people and found that the mass the elephant had been crushing under its feet were the bodies of the two officers. The brute must have caught them when they were thrown to the ground and killed them with a blow of its trunk or a crush of the foot, and it had then mangled the two bodies together. We got a cart and brought the bodies away. Simple in all its ghastly details, the tale was enough to make one's blood run cold, but heard as it was, said one present, within a few yards of what that bundle of native blankets contained, it steeled one's heart for revenge. But 
Let us leave this painful narrative and hasten on to the time when the monster met with his demise at the hand of one of the finest sportsmen that ever lived. Gordon Cumming was a noted shikari, almost as famous in his way as his brother, the celebrated Lion Slayer of South Africa, and his equally famous sister, the talented artist and explorer of Maori fastnesses in New Zealand. Standing over six feet in his stockings and of proportionate breadth of shoulder, he was an athlete in every sense of the word. With his heavy double rifle over his shoulder, and with Yalu, his native tracker and shikari, at his heels, he would think nothing of a twenty-mile swelter after a wounded bison, even in the hottest weather. An unerring shot, he was known to calmly await the furious onset of a tiger till the brute was within a few yards, and then lay it low with the ball crashing through its skull. It is even said that having tracked a noted man-eater to its lair, he disdained to shoot at the sleeping brute, but roused it with a stone and then shot it as it was making at him open-mouthed. He was known to decline to take part in beats for game or to use an elephant to shoot from, but would always go alone save for his factotum Yalu and would follow up the most dangerous game on foot. He was a man of few words, and it was with the greatest difficulty he could be got to talk of his adventures. When pressed to relate an incident in which it was known that he had done a deed of the utmost daring, he would dismiss the subject with half a dozen words, generally, Yes, the beast came at me, and I shot him. Yalu was as loquacious as his master was reticent, and it was through his glibness of tongue round the campfire that much of Gordon Cummings' shikar doings became known. Yalu believed absolutely in his master and would follow him anywhere. He carries two deaths in his hand and can place them where he likes, alluding to his master's accuracy with the rifle, and therefore, why should I fear? Has a beast two lives that I should dread him? A single shot is enough, and even a rakshas, a giant demon, would lie low. A deputy commissioner in the Mysore service, Gordon Cumming was posted at Shimoga, in the northwest of the province, when he heard of the doings of Pier Bux at Hunsur, and obtained permission to try and bag him. He soon heard all the khabar, or news, as to the habits of the brute, and he determined to systematically stock him down. For this purpose, he established three or four small camps at various points in the districts ravaged by the brute, so that he might not be hampered with the camp following him about, but could call in at any of the temporary shelters he had put up and get such refreshment as he required. He knew it would be a work of days, perhaps weeks, following up the tracks of the rogue who was here today and twenty miles off tomorrow. But he had confidence in his own staying powers, and he trusted to the chapter of lucky accidents to cut short a toilsome stock. Selecting the banks of the Kabini River as the most likely place to fall in with the tracks of Pier Bucks, Gordon Cumming made Karkankote his resting place for the time, while a careful examination was made of the ground on the left bank of the river. Tracks were soon found, but these always led to the river, where they were lost, and no further trace of them was found on either bank. He learned from the Kurumbas that the elephant was in the habit of entering the river and floating down for a mile or so before it made for the banks. As it travelled during the night and generally laid up in dense thicket during the day, there was some chance of coming up with it if only the more recent tracks could be followed up uninterruptedly. But with the constant breaks in the scent whenever the animal took to the water, he soon saw that tracking would be useless in such country and that he must shift to where there were no large streams. A couple of weeks had been spent in the arduous work of following up the brute from Karkankote to Fraserpet and back again to the river near Hunsur, and then on to Hegadaven Kota. Even the tireless Yalu now became wearied and began to doubt the good fortune of his master. Yet Gordon Cumming was as keen as ever, and would not give up his plan of following like a sleuth hound on the tracks of the brute. On several occasions they had fallen in with other parties out on the same errand as themselves, but these contented themselves with lying in wait at certain points the brute was known to frequent. 
These parties had invariably asked Gordon Cumming to join them as they pronounced his stern chase a wild goose one and said he was as likely to come up with the flying Dutchman as he was with the terror of Hunsur. It was getting well into the third week of this long chase when the tracks led through some scrub jungle which would not give cover to anything larger than a spotted deer. They had come on to the ruins of an ancient village, the only signs of which were a small temple fast falling into decay, and an enormous banyan tree or ficus religiosa. It was midday, the heat was intense, and they sat under the shade of the tree for a little rest. Cumming was munching on a biscuit, while Yalu was chewing a little pan or beetle leaf, when a savage scream was heard, and there, not twenty paces off, was the terror of Hunsur coming down on them in a terrific charge. From the position in which Cumming was sitting, a fatal shot at the elephant was almost impossible, as it carried its head high and only its chest was exposed. A shot at its chest might rake the body without touching lungs or heart, and then the brute would be on him. Without the least sign of haste, and with the utmost unconcern, Gordon Cumming, still seated, flung his sola topi, or sun hat, at the beast when it was about ten yards from him. The rogue stopped momentarily to examine this strange object, and lowered its head for the purpose. This was exactly what Cumming wanted, and quick as thought, a bullet, planted in the center of the prominence just above the trunk, crashed through its skull, and the terror of Hunsur dropped like a stone, shot dead.